book club. We read the book Untamed by Glennon Doyle. I loved it. I had so many personal resonations with this book. It was a great, great read. Um, I learned a lot about myself in this read, um, and I highly recommend it. So Kirsten and Kathy and I discuss. We do have a few negatives, but it's almost entirely positive. Great read. So if you haven't read Untamed by Glennon Doyle, highly recommend it. Um, If you did and uh, you're listening to the book club, I hope you enjoy this book club episode. I thought it was a pretty good one. Next book club book we're reading is Pride and Prejudice. We decided to go into a classic and uh, we're going to read a classic, Pride and Prejudice. Um, My experience with classic books in an audio form has been awesome. I just listened to Jane Eyre and it was so great in an audio book. So that's probably what I'm going to do because I've already read Pride and Prejudice more than once, but it hasn't been for a while. I'm probably going to just get the audio book and listen. And um, yeah, so if you don't feel like reading, that's another option for you is an audio book. I uh, hope you can read and join us. We're going to um, book club that book in April. So you have a good month and it should be fun. It's such a great book. If you haven't read Jane Austen, that's a great, that is probably my favorite Jane Austen book. It's really fun. Thanks for coming back every week. Thanks for all your positive comments about my daughters. They're pretty cool chicks. I mean, I think I'll keep them. But really, thank you so much for your positive um, comments from last week's episode, my first in-studio episode. Uh, It was really fun, and I'm looking forward to many, many more. Hopefully, everybody out there is getting their vaccines and um, feeling good, and maybe we can get ourselves back back to normal, if if normal will ever be like it was before. Maybe we should keep some of the abnormal, like staying at home more and enjoying our family. I don't know. Anyway, I wish everybody well, and uh, thanks for coming to Wife of the Party every week. I, I really appreciate it. Enjoy this book club, and enjoy your weekend. Hi, guys. Don't you look pretty? Thank you. So do you. I love Listen. your studio. Uh, don't look at this side. <laughs> and maybe don't look over here on the ground. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, this has become the catch-all. In order to keep Bert's studio nice and tidy, mm. mine has become the closet. Oh, I feel like this is a very good book to discuss. Then. Yeah, right? I think that's the story of my life. I'm the catch-all. <laughs> <laughs> also known as the closet. Also known as the doormat. Also known as... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this I got very aggravated two seconds ago because I wish you could see my desk. And none of it I did. And it makes me really frustrated. And I opened the room up for whoever needs to use it, but this is not what I meant. So I'm a little bummed. I, I was. Oh, honey, I relate. I think yeah. we probably all do. <laughs> I mean, moms, like, moms, women. Yeah. Look at this. It's super frustrating. This is, yeah. this is right next to me. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this is on the other side. And when I came in, there was a, a different computer here and an empty coffee cup and an empty paper coffee cup and an empty water bottle. And I'm like, can I just have one space? <sighs> That's, I mean, I don't mind if you use it. Could you keep it looking nice for me? <laughs> How I feel about my car. I was like, it's my car. Why is everybody else's garbage in my car? I've given yeah. up on my desk. Like, I'm just <laughs> forgetting. <laughs> but my car, I'm like, it's my space. Please, please dirty up your own car. But it doesn't really work that way. No. So. Yeah, I feel that way about my car, too. Yeah. But really I've been driving a minivan uh, because, as you know, Georgia got rear-ended. And when they took her, when I took her car to the body shop, They were like, this is simple fix. We'll have it like seven to 10 days. That was a month ago. Um, And they, oh, I forgot to put myself on do not disturb. Sorry. Um, The, um, (laughs) 
the bumper was on back order. Because she's 16, she can't actually have the rental car. I have to have the rental car. And they gave me a, a minivan, which I have no problem with a minivan, but this particular minivan, it drives like a go-kart. I feel like it's going to explode at any minute. Like it's like, nee! at top speed and when i get to 65 the steering wheel starts shaking like this like i think they gave me the the worst car in their whole fleet because it was an insurance job right the insurance company's paying for it every day that i have it so they're not going to give me you know this was an upgrade because <laughs> he saw me pull up in this big lincoln and he was like oh you may need like a, a bigger car than what they approved. Like they approved a little bitty, you know, scoot around car. So he gave me an upgrade, which was this minivan. And I, we got the phone call today that her car is ready and I cannot get out of this minivan fast enough. But that's contributing to how I'm feeling because. I'm driving around in this shitty minivan while my daughter is driving around in a Lincoln Navigator. <laughs> and I keep going, this is not right. <laughs> and it's not her fault. She was rear-ended. It was totally not her fault. But I keep going, this is, there's just, it's just, this sucks for me. <laughs> this is not right. But oh, so typical. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Standard, standard operations over here at Chrysler how are you guys? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair's gotten so long, Kirsten. You know what? I've even cut it myself. Have like, you? Just trimmed it like an inch. Out. I know it's ridiculous. I think the last time I saw you guys in person, it was to my chin. And now it's like <laughs> almost to my boobs. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Everybody's kids back to school? Nope. No. No. No, are they going back, Kirsten? Um, unclear. Both of their schools, um, I think their plan to go back was about two weeks after spring break. Um, so um, Vivian doesn't go back until tomorrow. Camille started back today. So I think that their schools may be orchestrated it that way to see how crazy people in general went for spring break and see, you know, if there were more flare ups of the virus, because that seems to be what has happened after Thanksgiving and Christmas and, you know, every break that there's like a big um, flare up. So um, yeah, we'll see. To be determined. <laughs> TBD like the rest of the year. <laughs> yes. TBD like the rest of the year. Right. And Kathy, your kids are going back, aren't they? Yeah, they're in spring break this week, but starting next Monday, they're back in person, full time, all day, every day. Can't flipping wait. <laughs> <laughs> My children don't feel the same way, but oh, no? I am like dancing in the streets. You know what? They're actually better with it. They're they've gotten more used to the idea, but they were really. They're like, I just don't want to start over for six weeks. Like, mm -hmm. it just feels so daunting to start yeah. the school year and end in six weeks. Because right. in their brain, they're like, I don't even have a locker. Like, right. I have to carry all my shit around. I got to bring lunch. Like, I can't just walk to the kitchen. Like, it is a big adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, and they were not really looking forward to it. And I mm -hmm. think they're a little bit more resolved to it. I think the past two weeks, we had this sort of hybrid on-campus every other day situation. Right. So it sort of helped them mm -hmm. get in the mindset right. of what life is going to be like. Of we're going um, back. However, neither of them have adjusted their sleep schedules over this spring break so far. <laughs> so next Monday is not going to be pretty, but uh, it generally happens after spring break, I feel like. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting to see how, um, how they, how it regulates their moods or their feelings after they've been back in normalcy for a minute. It is going to be a tough transition. The first probably yeah. two weeks are going to be hard. Right. But the last month. We over. I know. And yeah. the last month is so weird because there's like a week of finals. And then, you know what I mean? Like it's such a weird week, month anyway. Yeah. Like Memorial Day in, in there. there yeah. And then they like have prep for finals and then finals. You're like, okay, <laughs> why yeah. are we doing this? I'm yeah, sure. that's crazy. Um, I think, but yeah. it'll be really good. They it both will. really, really need it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Isla and Georgia went back to school for two days, and Isla was like, I feel like myself again. 
I feel yeah. like a person again. I really need to be in school. She didn't even want spring break. She was like, I don't want to go to spring break. I'd just rather keep going to school. Um, but their school, I think, has thrown out finals. They're like, we're not doing any of that. I mean, this is just, they. I think they've based, I, this has not been told to me officially. Don't anybody who goes to my kid's school think that this is any official <laughs> announcement. But my my kind of deduction is the school year doesn't really count, right? So why would we make them do finals? Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of what their philosophy is. There's so much going on here that has nothing to do with education. Yeah. Why are we going to stress them out further by piling that's, on a bunch of finals? That's interesting. I wonder... I'm assuming we're having finals. I've heard nothing. Mm-hmm. I'm actually still waiting to hear what the protocol is when we return next Monday. Mm. Like, there's just a lot of things that I have questions about that we haven't been told yet. Right. I'm hoping they're going to get around to telling us. But right, they will. You know, I'm sure they will. You'll but. get a laundry list on Sunday night. Yeah. <laughs> you need a hazmat suit right. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're getting tested once a week, but like, oh, I'm right. like, well, how does that work? Right. Like. Do I have to bring them to testing? What day of the week is this testing? Like, do they go during a free period? How do I get the results? Like, I have a lot of questions about this, and I know nothing. I just know I had to fill out the form where they get tested once a week. I don't so. think my our school's doing that. They are. Yeah. They have to fill out a health questionnaire every day. Every day. Yeah, we do that yeah. too. Take their temperature at home every day, and then yeah. their temperature is taken before they get out of the car. And yeah. I think yeah. that's where they're just calling it a day. I haven't heard anything about anybody getting tested. I think that through the end of the year, as far as I know, they're on campus one week at home the following week. So half the school is there and the other half is at home. And I think their theory is, again, I don't know officially, this is just what I think, that they're like, if someone in that half of the school is infected, then, you know, we have like four or five days with them at home to kind of figure out what's going on, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of quarantine and then say, okay, all of you people are quarantined and none of you can come to campus. I think that's maybe part of what their protocol is. I don't know. They went over it with uh, the health department, I guess. And the health department said, sounds good. Yes. So I guess we just have to trust it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I almost, part of the process though. Like I do believe that they are trying the absolute best they can. They want kids back on campus. Mm-hmm. Like they do, they get how detrimental this is. So I do have faith mm-hmm. as much as I don't understand why everybody has a different plan. Yeah, They all are really trying hard to keep everyone safe and get them back to school. Right, so right, right. Hmm. It'll be what it'll be. <laughs> it'll be what it'll be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, should we talk about this book? Sure. sure. I love this book. I, I loved, loved it. it too. You did. Did you like it, Kathy? I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Love is a strong word. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't love it. I liked it a lot. I actually thought she was a really good writer. There were yeah. parts where I was really moved by what mm-hmm. she was saying, but there were a couple things that just rubbed me the wrong way. But overall, I really liked it. I am I'm, I'm waiting for the day. If we ever get a day when <sighs> Kathy loves a book, I will a bitch, right? I will drop dead. <laughs> no, you're not a bitch. You just are. A, a heart you're a harsher critic than us which is fine but uh, like but that's I'm why it's surprised. good to have you as part of this podcast <laughs> yeah. right because a uh, negative nelly over here we've we just never had like, a yes. love yeah 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 but if we were all three were like yep 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 it wouldn't be as interesting of a, a conversation yeah. so i'm glad you don't like it love it that you like yeah, it but i don't know like i really it. did like it a lot but yeah so let's talk about it i know kirsten has notes mm-hmm. i have mental notes yeah, um, well, I mean, to be honest, though, there's, I feel like there's so much of it. This is my yeah. book. Um, there, That's, I mean, there's so much. There's and the point at which I stopped putting. Exactly. Because I was I, like, I just can't. Yeah. I, I just, I couldn't. I, I'm like every single, I'm like, you know, the highlighters, like I got the pink and the orange and the yellow going and all the different, I'm like, no, I, I got to just call it a day. I'm like, I've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I didn't even start because I went, well, I would just say, highlight this entire page and then turn the page uh-huh. and highlight this entire page. Totally. And I was like, there's no totally. point in that. I can't really yeah. do that. I have to really just kind of, um, I have a lot to say about it without doing that. So, um, I felt like this was the first book I've ever read 
that explains the way I feel about God. First book I've ever read. Yeah. This is exactly how I feel about my relationship with God and about where religion fits into that Mm -hmm. or doesn't. Um, I was brought up a little bit religious, and it definitely plays a part in my spirituality and my connection to God. But I, I just everything she said about her God, I was like, finally, I found somebody who understands how I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, you felt the same way, or? Yeah, I think it was a really great explanation for a lot of people who are struggling. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up pretty, not, I don't want to say pretty religious, but we had a very strong Catholic upbringing, mm-hmm. um, and I certainly don't follow that to this day, that's for sure. (laughs) Um, But my relationship is a little more complicated. There's a lot of Catholic guilt and that doesn't really go away, which is part of what she talks about is, Mm -hmm. you know, the the upbringing that is sort of like underneath that culture that's inside of you that you sort of have to fight against, or at least acknowledge that it's there and whether you choose to follow it or not. Mm -hmm. um, It's hard to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I thought she did a really good job of explaining, and I can understand how a ton of people relate to that. I related to what she was saying. Mm-hmm. I feel a little more complicated, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was really, uh, really helpful to a lot of people. I would imagine. Yeah, it was. It, I love. I lo- I just loved her when she was talking about religion. I just kept going. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Thank God. What about you, Kirsten? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, same, same. I have nothing new to add to that conversation other than sort of related, unrelated. Um, I remember when before Glennon had books out and she was a blogger and she was a really popular blogger. And when I read blogs, I just, I um, stayed away from her because she was like the Christian mommy blogger. And I was like, Oh, pass, you know, (laughs) not interested. Um, And so and I've, I've read, um, I read her other two books, um, uh, Love Warrior and what was the other one? Anyway, it doesn't matter, but um, I, I like her. I'm always like surprised that I like her so much. And when I read this, I was like, oh, why did I stay away? Like, I, you know, just because I don't go to her church um, doesn't mean we don't believe the same things. Right. That's interesting. That is true. You know, I think people think that about religion a lot, too. Mm -hmm. If you go to a church, you are of that mindset entirely, maybe. And that that doesn't have to be true. Um, I'm not Catholic. I don't I don't know anything about Catholicism, but I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral all the time. And I went to some services in that cathedral when I was in New York City and I had no idea what was going on. But because I, I'm not Catholic and, you know, they say the same prayer, everybody recites the same prayer at the same time. And I was like, I have no idea what's happening, but I still felt close to God in that church because it's such a powerful place. But I don't feel like people allow themselves to do that or the people who are in the church allow someone to just wander in and look around and leave. You know, they want you to be a member, be committed and, you know, it's interesting you say that the first time I went to temple, you know, never been inside a Jewish temple. It was conservative. I was very much uh, on display. Everyone knew I was coming, like the whole <laughs> congregation or whatever. But I do remember actually still feeling connected, feeling something. And it wasn't about the religion because everything about it. I was like, what the hell is happening right now? Uh-huh. It's like, well, you're in a different language. And why is everyone talking? Like you don't speak during a Catholic mass. And here people are like, how are you? They're hugging across the aisles. I was like, oh my God. I was like so stressed by the whole thing. But um, I found it really interesting that I could feel a connection somewhere else, which I had never really anticipated because mm-hmm. I had never experienced anything different my entire life. So if people can step outside, it's actually really interesting. You can find that connection in a lot of places and it doesn't have to be in any sort of religious building. But, but don't you think that strengthens your relationship with God to, to yeah. find that you can walk into somewhere where you, you know, this has to do with God, but you don't even know what's going on. And somehow you still have a connection. It's got to be and like, and the stuff they're saying is sort of pointless. Like, I know that's going to probably offend a lot of people, but like, 
sort of what she is saying is that your relationship really is so personal. It's not about the religious doctrine that's being preached at that temple or synagogue or congregation, whatever it is, you know, it really is far more personal than that. And you can find that in many different places. I think so. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Pretty crazy story that she had, you know, in the beginning of this book, um, I did not know any of that background, by the no. way. I had no idea who this person was. No, I didn't was. either. No, I entered totally blind, too. I had yeah. no idea. So I know a lot of, I've talked about this, I think, before with listeners, but maybe not. Um, definitely not in a while. Um, in my uh, teens and 20s, I drank quite a lot. I drank so much, in fact, that by the time I was 20, I had lost most of my hair. And my mom took me to the doctor uh, because I was losing my hair. And the doctor said, uh, she's in very bad shape. Her liver is really enlarged. And um, she's in really bad shape. She's she's drinking too much. And my mom, I told my mom I didn't drink. <laughs> my mom didn't drink. My mom still, did, I, as far as I know, still doesn't drink. And so she was like, no, that's definitely something else. Definitely something else is going on. She had a cortisone shot from an injury, and she's clearly had an allergic reaction to this cortisone shot. <sighs> that was not it. I started drinking so young and so much and so often. Like on my 21st birthday, after I'd started losing my hair, I drank a fifth of vodka by myself on that night, which is a lot, God. all by myself. So I clearly had alcohol problems, right? But at a certain point, I said to myself, I don't think my problem is actually with alcohol. I think it's with, uh, like, me. They're, they're, I, I'm broken, and I need help. I need, like, to get into therapy and figure out why I do this to myself. Because this is about self-loathing, which is very similar to, I think, what she experienced. As a child, mine didn't start at 10. Like, her bulimia started at 10 or 11. Mine started at 13. Uh, I started drinking when I was 13, which we have 14, 15 year old, 13 year old kids. Could you imagine? <laughs> Can't even imagine. <laughs> but I did. Um, and a lot of her story about, you know, being out of control and being in bad health and uh, was um, really hard for me to read because I don't think I'd, I've really processed a lot of that pain about how self-punishing I was you know that was about punishment I really think I wanted to die but I didn't want to kill myself so I just drank myself almost you know I mean when you start losing your hair <laughs> I mean I was bald from the ears down fully bald like the inside of your arm like this there's no nothing would even grow and then I had a, two patches right here that were totally bald. Um, so I wore like hats and I'd part my hair weird and just kept on drinking. I really didn't think it had anything to do with drinking. I thought I just had no idea what was going on. Um, so during reading this book, while working out with my trainer, <laughs> I had a lot of emotional workouts where I was in the middle of reading the stuff about her um, being this damaged person and drinking and and um, kind of masking it and it relating to me. And then I'd get in a workout and we, you know, I have this injury in my back. And every time we'd get into that injury in my back, I'd fall apart. And I'd say, I can't actually do this exercise. I, I actually physically can't do it. And he would say to me, you did this same exercise last week. So yes, you can. Yes, you, you actually can. You've already done it. So just do it again. And my body would not do it. Like, and I would get so frustrated. But I guarantee you that part of my body is where I put a lot of this pain. And so I just kept pushing myself with him until I could do that exercise again. It was like a core abdominal, like where your, 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 your upper body and your lower body goes up and down at the same time. And I couldn't get my legs to raise. I get my, my legs were like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> it took me, and I told him what was going on. I said, listen, I'm reading this book that's really kicking my butt. 
And this is exactly where I was at a time in my life. And, and this is why this, hap- this is happening. So I understand what's going on. I understand why my body is saying no, but I don't want that to be the way I function. I want to work it out. So he just every single day was like, and the exercise, and the <laughs> exercise. And I was like, ah. But finally, it started working again. It took about, it took a, like a full week, which seems very short. But I've been aggressively working on myself for so long. I think I have some shortcuts in place that, you know, I really wanted to not have that in my body. But any, I mean, there was one point when I was reading that part of her book and the inside of me was shaking. You know, you ever feel like your insides are shaking? My whole torso was just shuddering on the inside. So I just, I had no idea. I had no idea that this was what was going to happen for me with this book. You know, I had no idea what the book was about. I knew you had explained that she was hetero and had met a gay woman and fell immediately in love. And I understood all that, but I just didn't know that piece was going to be there. It really kind of kicked my ass. It's a really, it is a really deep um, book. I think there's, you know. There's a lot there. It's yeah. You go in thinking like, oh, it's just her story. And you know, I'm not a lesbian, so I'm not going to have that visceral reaction to it, but it's not about any of the labels that we call ourselves. It's all all about all of the deep stuff. It's about love hard. Really? Well, she's done a ton of work on herself too. Mm, She has. I mean, I think that's what a lot of this book is about, Mm -hmm. you know, how far she's come and, you know, I'm sure her other books touch upon this as well, but Clearly, she struggled for a big part of her life, you know? Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. It seems like it. Um, She's an impressive human being. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. To have been able to have evolved to this place is very impressive and inspiring and beautiful. Um, And the way that she described, you know, I thought this book was very open and honest and raw. I mean, I don't know her, so I can't say if it is open and honest and raw, but that's my impression is that she just kind of let it all hang out. Um, And that was really beautiful and so brave and it could help so many people, you know, to think what in my life is not working and why and just to be open to what you know, you're supposed to have, so to speak. I'm sure she wasn't walking around thinking, "Hmm, I think I need a woman. (laughs) I don't think she was doing that. I think she just saw Abby and went, oh, that's what I've been looking for my whole life. And so crazy. I don't know. Like it was so, I mean, how difficult for her to be a Christian blogger who is, you know, very well known to get up and say, hey, guess what, guys? Everything I've been talking about for however long, all these books I've written about Christianity and saving my marriage, guess what? I'm now gay. Do you know what I mean? Like how unbelievably difficult had, like not only for that personal struggle, but then to play out in a public forum. Yeah. Like, that has got to be so challenging. And yeah. People are not nice sometimes. So I can only imagine how that may not have been received well. Or how terrifying it would be Just to say, how will this be received? You know, how, what happens now? Um, Yeah, crazy, huh? And the courage it takes to to do it anyway, to know that that's who you are and that's what you need and want in life and to take that chance. Like, that's impressive. Yeah, it was very, very crazy. Very crazy. What are some of your notes, Kirsten? Well, I don't know about my note. I mean, my notes, I like, you know, it would just take two, two, we don't have this kind of time. You guys, we're busy. <laughs> well, we've talked about the religion of it and we've talked about that. Well, I talked about that trauma piece. Anything else that really hit the nail stood- on the head when you said that, like, we could just read the whole thing, you know, I know. Like, right? Like the whole thing. Um because yeah, that's the problem is that I was like, oh, you know, any good parts to share? No, it, it would just be like a whole page here and then the following page. Right. <laughs> just read the um, whole book. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. Well, I can ask you the question. I printed up questions from, I oh, found. you did? Oh, yeah. A lot of websites um, have book clubs. You're on- so much better than me at my own <laughs> podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you for being better than me at my podcast. I sincerely thank you because I I did not get to finish the book. I have about 20 pages left and I pushed so hard to get. I've been reading so many other things for work that I ha- it. It has to go on the back burner. Well, and you also Um, had a very visceral response to it. I mean, I think that we all had a strong response to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I definitely, I, you know, I cried in parts, whatever, Mm -hmm. but I did not have the response that you had. I didn't have a pain response. I didn't have, I did, my story doesn't align as much with her story. I appreciated it on a, you know, on another level, but I think that you had such a powerful visceral response that it's just going to take you longer to finish this damn book. Like even you if you didn't right. have yeah. so much going on, you know? Yeah. yeah you may but, be right. There was a time when it was in that little rough part where I had to put it down and take a minute and process what I had read and then pick it back up and then take a minute because that she talks about that stuff more in the beginning of the book. The end of the book, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a progression into her um, her marriage and parenting and that kind of stuff. So maybe, maybe. Thanks for the out. Um, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I actually did find a paragraph that I would love to read um, before going into these questions because this I just thought is was is so universal to all of us and particularly as women. I looked hard at my faith, my friendships, my work, my sexuality, my entire life, and asked. How much of this was my idea? Do I truly want any of this? Or is this what I was conditioned to want? Which of my beliefs are my own creation and which were programmed into me? How much of who I become is inherent and how much was just inherited? How much of the way I look and speak and behave is just how other people have trained me to look and speak and behave? How many of the things I've spent my life chasing are just dirty pink bunnies? who who was I before I became who the world told me to be that I related to so much. I just, yeah. it is, it's crazy. Um, that is crazy. That is a crazy um, ask, right? She's asking herself or us, the reader to look at every piece and say, did you choose this or was it chosen for you? Well, and I love the fact that she's actually still struggling with it because much later in the book, when she talks about, you know, Abby resting in the middle of the day and she's like pissed at her for it. And she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't about that. This is about me. This is about what I've been conditioned to believe. And do I really want to hold on to that? So I love the fact that she can say I'm a work in progress. Like I think people forget that it doesn't just like you don't just fix something like it continues. And you have to acknowledge what's going on for you. Like, that's the only way you're going to continue to make progress. So, I don't know. I feel like she is very open and genuine. I know you're saying that before. But I do feel like, and I obviously have no idea who this woman is, but it does feel very genuine to me. Yes, it does. It's very hard, I think, to, to you're right, to keep in mind that we are a work in progress and to be patient with ourselves and also to not think that who you are today will work in five years because it might not work. Um, that That is something that I've learned from being married. You know, like who Bert and I were when we first got married is not the same to who we are today. And, and some of it is very humbling, you know, to say, no, actually, I'm being rigid and immovable and not cool in this moment. However, this is the way I've always been. So to stop and say, the way I've always been is no longer working. And to have yourself be okay with that, I think, is a difficult place to be. I never witnessed that happen in my family where someone stopped and said, hmm, maybe I need to adjust myself here because the relationship I find myself in is a bit different. I don't mean that you become less of who you are or swallow yourself or uh, take abuse. That, that's not what I mean. What I mean is saying my, for a perfect example, my tolerance and intolerance of anxiety in my house has to constantly change. That's a very clear example for me of how my behavior 
I have to evaluate along with theirs and what worked for many, many years may not work anymore. And to be able to say, that's okay. I, I want to change for the betterment of all of us. It's hard, I think, for some people. It's hard for me sometimes. Um, but yeah, she seems to want to do that. She seems to want to always be her best self. And that may not be what you were last week. You know, best selves change, don't they? You know, how many jo misogynistic jokes were super funny in the 80s? You know, we joke all the time about every John Hughes movie has like a date rape. <laughs> and it's <laughs> exactly. one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite movie makers of all time. And so you have to just, instead of saying, I will never watch another John Hughes movie, I say, let me explain to you the context in which this movie was made. Okay. <laughs> These things are not okay today. These things weren't okay then, but we didn't know it. Oh we goodness. thought it was really yeah. funny, but we it's just not had that conversation about 16 candles. Oy. Did you? Yes. I love that movie so much, but it's so problematic. It's so <laughs> problematic. So problematic. Right. She's so out of her mind. She won't even know. And you're like, oh my God, you just basically <laughs> said you could date rape her on the way home. Totally. And not to mention <laughs> the racism. I mean, there's, there's everything. Everything <laughs> about really that checked movie. every box in that movie. And I was like, but this was one of my all-time favorite movies. What does it say about me? Yes, it's very hard, but you have to say that was that was who we were then. This is who we are now. Who we were then is not any less. It just wasn't as progressed. That's all. It's okay. We've learned we know better, do better. Know better, do better. That's right. Um, before we move on to your questions, which I want to do, what, what did you guys think just in general about her parenting in this book? She does. I think she talks a lot about parenting. What did you guys think? Any overall impression about her parenting? I love her as a parent. I mean, she really talks and listens and changes as a result of her kids. Like the, the story about the um, one of her daughters is in kindergarten and learns about the um, melting polar ice caps and the polar bears and is so upset about it. And at first they're like, yes, we're, you know, we're with you. And they adopt some polar bears. Like, or they, you know, they throw money at it. They get her some toys, they get her some posters. And then she's just over it. And is like, if I hear about another freaking polar bear, I'm going to lose <laughs> my mind. <laughs> and then she has the revelation that her daughter is not the problem that we like the collective we that doesn't want to hear about the polar bears every day that we are the problem mm -hmm. that her daughter that some and that sometimes you know that living in your truth is uncomfortable for other people and you have to lean into that that discomfort and be okay with being uncomfortable for other people and um i I just loved that she shows the whole progression of that because I was with her a hundred percent for the whole thing. I was like, yes, how great that my daughter has her eyes opened and yes, I'm going to support this, support it, support it until you're like, Oh my God, enough, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But she really seemed to do that repeatedly um, with her kids where she really allows them to teach her and allows mm -hmm. them to lead her evolution. Yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, something that now that you've brought all that up that I like about her that I'm, I don't feel like I'm at, I think, I think I would like to be better at is understanding things more globally. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I understand things in my little bitty space, but I forget sometimes to think, wait a minute, globally what's happening global is a big word but like outside of ourselves like what you're saying the polar the, the the all of a sudden she went wait a minute the problem is actually that this makes other people uncomfortable not just the problems that my child is talking about this is making other people uncomfortable i feel like i would like to be better at that better at saying but wait what are the effects of this in a larger scale or what piece of this puzzle don't I understand that I would have no reason to understand because I have never experienced or, or researched or whatever that question is that I feel like I get so into 
a taskmaster of a day that sometimes I don't stop and think about it in a broad and think about whatever is happening in a broader way. Bert's a lot better at that than I am. Bert is really good at saying, but what does this mean culturally? Well, I just go, what it means is I'm going to be late for the dentist. (laughs) That's what it means. And then to stop and go, oh, hold on, wait, this is actually something a little larger. (laughs) I'm not very good at that sometimes. And Bert is far better uh, to stop and go, no, this is actually what's going on. And then when he'll explain it to me, I'll go, oh, my God, I had no idea. I had no idea that's what was going on. It makes perfect sense now that you explain it to me. But it feel, I feel like she's done that really well. She lays out several examples of where it starts as one tiny thing. And then she goes, oh, hold on. But wait, actually, it has to do with this much larger picture. That's such a great way of um, learning, I guess. Any thoughts on that? Ladies? I actually wish she had talked about her kids more. Like, I actually thought she you know, every time she talked about her parenting, uh, you know, again, I really liked that. She was like, Oh crap, I screwed up. And this is how I'm going to fix it. Or this is what I'm going to do. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wish there was more of that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I really, I can relate to a lot of what she said and I can wish that I were better at a lot of parenting (laughs) things, Right. you know, like her understanding her kids on that deeper level. Like, sometimes I feel like we get so wrapped up in, like, just get in the car, you know, that Mm -hmm. I miss what they're really trying to say. Right. So. I think she gets wrapped up in just to get in the car, too. But I think she takes the time to make and makes the space to reflect. Right. I think that's the difference is I am so busy trying to get to the next thing. I don't give myself the space to reflect. And really think about it. Whereas Bert Kreischer, who naps half the day, not really. He's a he is genuinely the busiest guy I know. But if that guy can snag a nap, you best believe he's going to do it. And I'm like, if I could snag a nap, I could also get 18 things done. So I'm just going to do the 18 things. And I think it's in those quiet moments, or it is in those quiet moments where you can have reflection and say, hmm, maybe I, maybe I missed that one piece. Yeah. I mean, part of that though is in the act of writing. I think she talks about writing in the book, um, but you know, this is a memoir. And so the act of writing a memoir is reflection. So she's very, I mean, she's definitely the kind of mom like us who's racing around and going, get in the damn car. And, you know, and there's a mess here and she freaks out about all, you know, all sorts of normal mom freak out things, but it's partly in the act of writing a memoir that you can not just can be reflective, but you must be reflective. So sometimes just in the writing it out, you have that aha moment of, oh, that's why it happened that way. Right. Or whatever. Right, right. Okay, let's do your questions. Okay. These are not my questions. These are the questions that you printed. Called from the internet. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. One of these is, uh, what are your, pre- your own preconceived thoughts about what your life is supposed to look like? Huh? So I thought about one, uh-huh. um, which is, and this was, this was a while ago, but when I went to theater school in New York, there was a guy in our year who everybody called Superman because he had a a Christopher Reeve jawline and was, you know, tall and built and very handsome, very GQ handsome Superman. He was like a blonde Superman. And everybody was like, oh, just like, oh, he's going to be a big star and he's just gorgeous and all this stuff about him. And he wasn't my type. I'm not into blondes. I'm not into the whole, you know, built model type. It just, I was just like, Okay, whatever. Well, damned if I didn't end up dating that guy because, (laughs) but I it it did it took me a long time to reflect on this that it was like oh that was a preconceived idea about what I should want like Mm. about what I should like what is successful what so what was considered successful within this community of people was whoever dates that guy is the lucky one. And I wanted to be the lucky one, you know, the, the one, and we didn't really have a lot in common. And we, 
were together for four years. Wow. That's a long time. And um, we, ha- you know, are not in touch to this day because we, you know, we honestly weren't really even friends. Like, <laughs> just I look back at that and I go, we have, we have so little in common. And it even led back as far as like, I wasn't even that interested. You know, I wasn't even interested in him until that seed was planted that, oh, everyone's interested in this. And I was like, oh, I guess I am. If I can get it, then I should. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Huh. It sounds really stupid. When I say this, I'm sure people are going to be listening to this going, what an idiot. What a bimbo. Whatever. No, I don't think it sounds stupid at all. I think it is completely relatable because I think about a lot of girls I knew in, in college who thought that they wanted this type of guy to be their husband forever and they end up divorcing because that's what they thought they should have. They thought they should be engaged by the time they were out of college. They thought they should have this type of job. And that's not usually what makes you happy is what you think you should do. Right. I think, um, I was given the gift of, uh, from my mom of having someone who was so controlling that I went, no, no, no. I'm just going to make this up as I go. I mean, one of the things I'll never forget my mom saying to me as a a kid was, if you grow up and turn into a stay-at-home mom, I will have no respect for you. I'm a stay-at-home mom. (laughs) So clearly that preconceived notion of I must be a liberated woman who works. Now, don't get me wrong. I do work. But my first job has been for a long time a stay-at-home mom. Um, But when you said that, the first thing that I thought of was – my dad worked six days a week from sun up till 10 o'clock at night. Sounds a lot like my life. <laughs> and my dad was supposed to come out here uh, this week. And I had to push him a week because uh, we got so busy with our with our business that I was like, I need to push you a week. And he was totally cool. He was really nice, but I felt really guilty about it because we are going camping this weekend and he was going to go camping with us. But with pushing a week, he's not going to be able to go camping. He's going to miss the kids spring break, but it just kind of, it wasn't working for me. So I was trying to take care of myself and push him another week so I could really enjoy and focus on him. And in the middle of, uh, my guilt, uh, talking to my dad and apologizing profusely for having to move his time and that he's missing the camping trip. In the middle of it, I said to him, you know, you're the person who taught me how to work and I'm working like you're working. I'm working six, seven days a week, sun up till 10 o'clock at night, every single day. So this is why I have to push your trip. Not that I was blaming him, but I had that realization in that moment that that's where I learned how to work. And anything less than that, I think makes me really uncomfortable. So if there's the first preconceived notion from that question is I need to conceive a new notion of what work looks like, because I think I work myself into the ground and my dad did also my dad. I'm the same as my dad. Now, if my dad sits down, he falls asleep. Two seconds sitting down and he's asleep. And I'm at that place now. I can't watch a movie. I can hardly get through a book. It could be 10 in the morning. It could be one in the afternoon. If I am seated and not actively engaged in something, I am asleep like a narcoleptic. (laughs) Because your body isn't used to that. Your body is not used to being at rest unless you are asleep, literally going to sleep. Yeah. Yes. That's what I've trained it to do, which is exactly what my dad did. Mm -hmm. My dad would come to his mom's for lunch, sit in her recliner and fall asleep until she said dinner's on the table. And then he'd wake up, go eat dinner and go right back to work. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't get home till like 10 o'clock at night. So he'd take a shower, go to bed. So I'll have to work on that preconceived notion. I think it's not super healthy. Yeah, it doesn't sound particularly healthy. No. Kathy, what about you? What, what was your reaction oh, no, to that I question? No, it's funny. Wayne. I didn't really have anything immediately that popped in my head when Kirsten asked the question. But when you started talking about the rebellion, I was thinking that in high school, my mom was like, this is the guy you have to date. Um, this 
Catholic <laughs> guy <laughs> that she was in love with, like whatever. There was this long thing. And I was like, I don't like him. I'm not interested. So of course, you know, I end up dating the Jew that we end up marrying and <laughs> whatnot, yes. like complete opposite or whatever. But um, you know, and part of that was definitively a rebellion about whatever she wants. I'm definitely not going to have. Um, but I think that was some sort of preconceived notion. Like this is the expectation. You're going to marry somebody like this human and that's the end of it. Um, beyond that, I don't know what other sort of preconceived notions I have other than like the stupid, like, Oh, you know, two parent household, like 2.2 kids, white picket fence and a puppy, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then again, that is my life. So I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's healthy or not healthy, but. Well, I wonder if there are any about um, mental health or about um, physical health or anything uh, about friendships or about. You know, I feel like so much of my the things I was brought up to believe or have been ingrained in my head are things that I have really sort of rebelled against. Like my family, God love them, is very uneducated and leans towards racist or prejudiced in a lot of ways. Like some of the language they still use, like it's just not something I would never, ever use or understand or relate to. And I can only argue so much with them about it. So I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of that is very different. So maybe mm -hmm. it is redefining these preconceived notions or just fighting against what I was brought up to believe or think. Interesting. Interesting. I, I know that um, I had a preconceived notion about, um, I, I don't know where I learned this, who taught it to me, but I learned it. Um, when I was little, I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be an actress and I wanted to be an author. And I chose, I went down the path of actress and I, you know, I, after my bachelor's degree, I did, I went to theater school and I, you know, I worked as an actor um, until I got pregnant with Camille. And then I had that moment where I was like, I'm done. This, mm. this path is over. Um, and I'm now at a much later date at almost 49 years old, um, taking another, I'm about to start another memoir class. This will be my third in a row. And I've been working on my memoir since um, October and have two thirds of it done. That's amazing. Um, That's and yeah, and I'm really happy. And I'm so happy doing this. I'm so happy doing this. I've never stopped writing. I've been writing all of these years, but it ha I've never put anything out into public. I've never, I, you know, I, Leanne knows that I have a, a novel that was sitting into the, in the garage before you and Jocelyn bullied me to bring it inside the house. <laughs> yep. We still haven't so, seen that novel. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Jocelyn's yeah. still waiting. Oh, but I'm working on the memoir though. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, I have all this stuff and it, I realized that it goes back to my idea that you could do one or the other that I remember hearing at some point, I think it was like an actor published a book and people were like, Ugh, you know, you're an actor, like do, do what you do. Um, and, you know, there's always like, there are always naysayers to think when somebody does something outside of what they are known for and actors, it's, you know, a little bit more heightened because it's in the public view. But I think in a, in a lesser thing, it's like a teacher who decides to start a, baking business on the weekends or whatever, that it's like, do what you do, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> stay in your lane that I, I really internalized this idea of stay in your lane. Um, you can't, it's greedy to want to be or do more than one thing. And, um, and I've just been so happy <laughs> writing this memoir. Like, I mean, it's, it's changed my life. It really like, <laughs> I could start crying right now talking That's about awesome. it. Um, it's really changed my life. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that I relate to in that question too, that I, that was a preconceived thought about what I thought life was supposed to look like, that it's like, choose one. Mm -hmm. You get to pick one. You don't get to be greedy. Right. Um, I heard that too. Actually, you know what? I have to tell you that goes to this quote in the book. 
that I found so interesting and it's so stupid, but it was about like, um, she's talking about like, I don't know, some revelation. And she said, um, maybe in a different life is what her thought was. And then she said, isn't that interesting? As if I had more than one. And I was like, (laughs) yeah. Like, right. What are we thinking? We do only have one. Like, why are we so programmed to like, oh, some other time, some other life. Like, that. Yes. I don't know. Like, it just struck me. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're saying. I that's one like. of the parts that I highlighted too, Kathy. Uh-huh. I just, I mean, that was like, you yeah. know, it's so simple. And yet it blew it's, my mind. That it's I was like, like one tiny sentence and you're like, oh my God. Where <laughs> I been, yeah. I'm like, wow. I really have been spending <laughs> most of my life feeling like there is another life coming, like, right? You know, I'll just get to that in my next life tomorrow. or the one after that or, tomorrow. or the one after that. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Is there any preconceived notion that uh, goes along with your experience of opening your baking business, Kathy? Well, now that you say that, I think a little bit like uh, it, maybe it has to do with like your end game is just being a stay at home mom. Like there's nothing that comes after that. Ah. So, and like, there's certainly no entrepreneurs or self starters. Actually, that's not true. My brother, my older brother is, but he was not necessarily super supported in that endeavor. Um, you know, and I followed the very traditional path, like you immediately go to college, then you go to grad school and whatever, and then you become a mom and then your life is over. Um, and apparently mine is still over. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, Hardly. I wonder now that we're talking about this, I wonder if that is something that I've never really consciously thought about before right. is that the end game really is being a stay at home mom. And that's all you do. Like there is no after that. It doesn't matter that your kids grow up or whatever. Like that's still it. Interesting. Yeah. That is really fascinating because. Yeah. Interesting because, you know, you are so very smart and uh, gifted and motivated and you get shit done. I mean, the amount of stuff we've done in Girl Scouts and for fundraising and really hardworking and, and, you are hardworking in your home also, but that is interesting that, because like, that next step, I just, I don't know what it is. I can't do it. And I don't like, I don't know if that's part of it or not. I've never really thought about it until this conversation, but maybe something to think about yeah. because, because you, what you do when you do all those baskets for me, they're so great. And I know that you've, you know, I've had so many conversations about getting yeah. a little bit in a little co- coffee shop, getting a little couple items in a coffee shop here, doing something there, but that next step isn't happening. Or so, I, I'm going to say that we're just way off the book, but yeah. this weekend I met with my brother and sister-in-law who are both designers um, about my logo. And as we were like flipping through pictures that I have of baskets or whatever, like I was looking at them, I was like, you're fucking good. Yeah, but, they are. I never, ever felt that way. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, they're fine. And I was like, huh. I was like really, really proud of myself. And I don't ever feel that way ever. I don't ever feel good about anything I do. I always think I've fucked something up, um, which is terrible, which is part of the reason I don't ever take the next step. But it was interesting this weekend. So that's really cool. And if you think that everything you do is terrible and a fuck up, where did that preconceived notion come from? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I oh, bet I could, I bet I could say your name, say your name, yeah. <laughs> but I won't, but I don't know. That's, I would imagine that's some kind of preconceived notion because I have those notions too. You know, yeah. I, it was definitely told to me that I would never be thin unless I completely starved myself. And so I've looked at my body and always been like, meh, never going to be thin. So I'm not willing to starve myself. I like hot dogs. I like pizza. I like potato chips. I like mac and cheese. And I'm just not going to do it. But, you know, I don't really, I don't feel bad about my body, but I definitely don't feel like, look at that hot body. (laughs) You know, I never have, even when I weighed a hundred pounds, you know, when I was tiny, tiny, um, that's definitely part of a preconceived notion. That's for what that's from, you know, growing up with someone who had a perfect body. My mom's body was like banging, slamming, 
what what she talks about in this book that they tell you is supposed to look like, right? You're supposed to look like, oh, your mom. <laughs> Guess what? You actually look like your dad's mom, <laughs> which is not at all the same. It's, that's a hard thing to unravel too, even though I really am very happy with my body because I'm super strong. I'm really, really physically a very strong person, but I'm definitely not going to put on a bikini, right? I'm not going to. And that's part of that preconceived notion I'm not willing to get past, right? No one needs to see me in a bikini because I don't look like my mom who looked like Cher, which is actually not even human. <laughs> I mean, from the neck down, she looked like freaking Cher. She was this big with big boobs. And it just doesn't happen. You're so genetic that there's, she's right for me to have ever even looked, I couldn't have looked like her. She was like four inches taller than me uh, and skinny and long. And it's amazing it, what she talks about in this book is really accurate. They, they show you these things that you should be that aren't possible for 95% of the population. You know, there's no way any of us could look like Angelina Jolie. I could possibly. There's no way, even if I starve myself. Um, and it's stuff that's not even necessarily told to you. Like you don't even realize no, like exactly. this is the preconceived notions that you're stuck with, you no. know? Yeah, totally. That's not told. It's just plastered all over life. Yeah. You know, it, it is plastered all over life. There's not, none of those, you know, if you, my dad had these Coca-Cola trays, these, they were vintage Coca-Cola trays in his house that had women from probably, I don't know, maybe the Victorian era, era, big hats with big feathers and corsets, but they were full-bodied women. Like they were full-bodied. And that was the sexy in those days where these yeah. women who had, they looked well-fed. They didn't look like obese, but they looked like they ate a good meal. <laughs> and you think back then, looking like you had a good meal on a regular basis meant you had money. Mm -hmm. So people wanted to look like that. And then all of a sudden- Yes, and that was attractive. And that's what most people can easily achieve is something that looks healthy, not even overweight, just healthy. This is a healthy body. As my body's healthy, I, I, I'm I, in my BMI range of exactly where I'm supposed to be. I, I, I mean, I weigh 127 pounds. I'm not overweight. But I still look at my body and go, that thing is not going in a bikini. <laughs> No way. <laughs> and not because I'm 50. It's because of my body. <laughs> so maybe I can work on that a little bit. Although I'm not sure I ever will get in a bikini. <laughs> I don't ever want to be the woman at the pool that everybody goes, do you see that in the bikini? Oh, my God. <laughs> no one would ever say thinking. that about you. You would look great. Yeah. And then be like, listen, I can do whatever the fuck I want because I'm 90. So <laughs> at 90, I might get in a bikini. If I make it to 90, I guarantee you a you bikini. You got 40 years to work on. <laughs> right. Okay. What's your next question? Um, let's see. So she talks about how women, especially, always go back to the mindset that they should be grateful for what they have and not really do anything to rock the boat. Um so let's talk about this concept. Why does it seem that women are forced to be agreeable and satisfied while men seem to be allowed to want something more? I think it's that preconceived notion of like gender norms, you know, like, yeah, she talks about that when, um, the gender norms, uh, when she goes in and she's going to be like a cool mom and hang out with her son and it, his friends. And, she says, hey, who's hungry? And they're like all watching TV and all the boys are still watching TV and they're all like, yeah, me. And all the girls are like, get very quiet and they kind of look to one another. And then one of them sort of establish herself, establishes herself as the mouthpiece and says, no, we're fine. Thank you. And man, that, that struck a nerve with me. Mm -hmm. I was that teenager, like, I mean, verbatim, like the exact story happened a million times at friends' houses. I was, and, and I'm sure it continues to this day that there's this, you know, part of it is the food thing of like, 
boys and men being conditioned to like, listen to their bodies, like really. And to, um, and, and that it's not gross to eat there. It's just, it's a physical need. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas girls and women are more conditioned to like, do you really need that slice of pizza or whatever the thing is? But I think it goes beyond that too. It's like, like, yeah. Yeah. And then, but also just like being polite and to not want to not express any want or need and to not, you know, not cause any trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though this mom is asking, can I get you something? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I've been in both boats of, of going, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat in front of the boys. Mm -hmm. I don't want to show that I'm gross. And I really, you know, want to pig out on this candy (laughs) or whatever, (laughs) like any of the treats, like the boys are, I don't want to be gross. I don't want to give anyone an excuse to say, oh, that's why her ass is that size or or whatever, (laughs) whatever the thing is like. um, And I remember my friend um, Conchata, who was heavy um, talking about how um, she was an actress and she said, I will never, I don't want to eat in a scene. I, I will ar- always argue against eating in a scene because it's just too simple. It's like a fat woman is eating and people are like, well, that's why she looks like that. Well, everyone has to eat. Everyone eats like, yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. you don't think that if, um, you know, if a thin woman is eating, you just think oh, there's a thin woman eating. But if a man of any size is eating, it's just a man eating. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, I hate shit like that. You know what I to- experience a lot is I'll be working with someone who's also working with my husband. And that person will speak to him so differently than they speak to me. Like most of the time, they will say to Bert, is it okay if we do ABC? And for me, they'll say, we're doing ABC. And I'm like, um, why are we doing ABC? Why? why? Instead of just saying, is it okay? Because I'm the, uh, definitely more compliant than my husband. But that's not how I'm approached. And that happens all over our business all over it. And it makes me so upset. Uh, It doesn't usually happen in front of him. It happens when that person is dealing with me without him. We will be doing ABC. And then I have to become the bitch that goes, but why? And now I'm a bitch. Where I go, you would never do that to him. I mean, I understand that he's the person making the money, but guess what? I am the person behind the person that's making the money, and I'm the person that writes the check for your money. (laughs) So he doesn't even know where our checkbook is or how to get a check written. That happens a lot, and I I don't like it, and I'm getting less and less um, tolerant of it in myself. I still haven't really spoken up about it, with people when that happens, because I, just like you described, I don't want to be the bitch because as soon as a woman says, hold on, you're not treating me the same as you treat my husband. She's a fucking bitch. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair because I can, I described something to Bert today and he was like, wow, that's very different. And they asked you the same question. They didn't ask I mean, it was the same scenario for both of us. And we got two very different attitudes. And I don't, I just, I think that's so wrong. And I think that happens everywhere all the time. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to take for someone's, I mean, it only happens actually for men. Women don't do that to me. Women in this business uh, are, treat me exactly the same as they treat Bert for the most part. Interesting. It only happens with men. And I wonder what it's going to take to have men understand that um, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know if they think, well, he's going to get aggro with me. I don't want to deal with it, so I'm going to be nice. Or I can just walk all over her, or I can just tell her whatever, and she has to do it. I, I don't know what the subconscious mindset is. I don't think it's conscious. I don't think someone goes, well, screw her. She's a woman. I think it is so subconscious that they don't even realize they do it. You know? I'm hopeful that our 
kids' generation is changing this dynamic. Mm. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's pie in the sky, but um, it feels like they interact with one another and their expectation is, it's like almost, it's like a positive sense of entitlement Mm -hmm. of being entitled to the same respect as the boys. But then again, our girls are still young enough that (laughs) there's still time. (laughs) <laughs> There's still, still time, time for the world to crush them. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time for education there yeah. <laughs> to go. Guess what? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I don't. Yeah, even know. I mean, I wish I were more shocked by your story, but I'm listening to it and going, "Yeah, I believe you. I see it all the time, and every, like, I think we all do. It's it's frustrating." We're in a business relationship right now with somebody where Bert and I are equal partners and the person we're in this business relationship with only texts him. If we need to schedule an appointment, only schedules it based on his schedule. And then I'm just supposed to follow along and uh, never even says, hey, I've I've figured this out with Bert. Does this work for you? No, it just shows up on the calendar. And I'm like, I mean, that's a different relationship than the one I was describing earlier. Those are two completely different people, both of the men. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I in every single meeting, Bert says, this is Leanne's project that we are doing together. And that fella texts him only. And I'm like, I, you know, part of me doesn't want to, but the truth of the matter is that project is only being made because Bert is involved in it because in the, in the world of this industry, I am Bert's wife and I completely understand the hierarchy of that. But one would think if one had been presented as an equal partner, that person that we're partnering with would treat us equally, but that's not happening. And I don't think he's being, he doesn't even, he's the nicest guy ever. I don't think it's a, Let's leave her out. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's like the the boys club mentality where that's just how he functions, not not meaning any disrespect by it. You know? <laughs> and then I'm going, well, I don't want to bring it up to Bert because I don't want him to have to handle it because is it really that important? Does it really matter? At the end of the it day, does, it works. I, I know, but I talk myself into not being the problem. Like you were talking about not wanting to eat in front of everybody, not mm-hmm. wanting to impose on that mom or whatever your thing mm-hmm. is. I don't want to be the problem. And part of that is the problem of that is anytime a woman is a problem, she's yeah. a bitch. And I, but I don't understand why, why it's not seen that, that, that is a problem that if we are partners, you're texting one partner or you're communicating with one partner, (laughs) Mm -hmm. then I'm not really a partner in that person's eyes on some level. I hate it. It sometimes makes me feel like, um, I don't belong here. You know, that I'm not welcome Um, and that I have to fight to feel welcome. And I don't really want to do that, that I should just be welcome because I am enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. A hundred percent. Deep thoughts today on wife of the party. Deep thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Women's issues. Deep thoughts. I think it's so funny how the, was it the last book that we read was the one that we were all like, yeah, I didn't really like it. <laughs> we didn't really have much to say. And then we're like, let's chat about something else. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this book really does stir up a lot though. Like I was surprised because I, I read it like a year ago or when, whenever it came out, I read it. <laughs> Got it from the library. And then this time, usually, Leanne, um, when I read the books for for this podcast, or honestly, when I buy any book or when a book is bought for me, I always think of <laughs> the resale value. <laughs> not, not the resale value, like I'm not going to sell it, but like the value of passing it on to someone else because I don't keep a lot, a ton of books. I mean, I know I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf, but I, I really don't keep a lot of the books that I read. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really was raised in a household, talk about a preconceived notion. Um, 
where you did not mark up a book. Like right. you do not mark up a book. So marking up a book is putting in a sticky that I can pull out. Yep. And this one, I finally accepted after I got about this way through, I was like, oh, screw it. And then I just <laughs> was, I'm like, no, I'm going to read this again and again, because it, it was really powerful. And I do need to sort of reread and, and redigest because this was a reread. Like uh-huh. mm-hmm. I read it for the second time and I found myself crying in parts and, um, that was surprising to me because, you know, I knew what was coming. It's not like it. And the crying in parts, isn't like, there's not a big reveal, like big reveal that she's, you know, leaves her marriage to um, marry a woman is at the beginning of the book. It's not like there's a big reveal and somebody dies and there's like a big tragedy. And that's why I'm crying. Like in a fiction book, it was just like, you know, powerful truths that I was like, wow, she really said that in a, that really <laughs> hit me in the gut. And, and she really said that in a very pithy, like perfect way. Um, mm-hmm. So many times there's so many one-liners, but you know, paragraphs, whole pages that it was like, Oh, that's yes. Yeah. Exactly. She's a great writer. Yeah. You know, one thing I've, I've, I, I know Kathy, you said you had a few things that you maybe did. I don't know if you said you didn't agree with them, but that didn't completely jive with you. But one thing that didn't, that I It was a couple things. But one thing I remember is when she had said, like, I really admired this concept, but I also found, I wonder how practically it can be applied. Meaning, um, uh, not everybody has the luxury of functioning the way that she does. Some people rely on people outside of their island as she calls it, of love, to pay their rent, to pay their bills. You know, sometimes a parent babysits a child, and that is a necessary thing for you to have your day-to-day life. You know, she is clearly a very successful person and is living with a very successful person and has the um, privilege and luxury of being able to say yes and no to things that other people in the world maybe can't. Mm-hmm. And so she was talking about when her mom was coming to visit and she and Abby and their kids are on an island of love and you can't come on that island unless you are 100% in love, right? And her mom mm-hmm. was still having some doubts and some feelings that were not 100%. And she was like, then you can't come visit. And that gave me pause where I went, I understand the theory of this. I understand what you're saying. But the absolute of that for a lot of people would be really hard, mm-hmm. I would imagine, to, to absolutely say either you're with me or you're out. And how un it's not unloving, but sort of unloving that is in and of itself to not embrace her mom with all her mom's doubts. Because she basically said, I hear your doubts. I respect your doubts. You can't come on my island. But I think that, I mean, I don't know. I hear what you're saying, but also it's not like she cut her mom out of her life. No, no, Um, it's not. She was just saying like right now, we can't have that in here because we're building something. Um, And I think that in some ways it was like a tough love thing to her mom of saying, look, I've been patient and have absorbed you and your thoughts my whole life. And now this is my time. And Mm -hmm. this is my time to have a boundary. I think it was just a boundary of Mm -hmm. saying like, yeah, this is a hard boundary for me. Um, because that's you know, one of the questions here um, that I printed up was about um, when her mom was str- struggling with her sexuality and Glennon recognizes that while her mother loves her, they disagree about what is best for her. So Glennon is going to have to decide who she trusts more, her mother or herself. And for the first time, she decides to trust herself. And she says that's when she became an adult. Um, And then the question here is that she says that a woman becomes a responsible parent when she stops being an obedient daughter, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is, you know, interesting. And I don't know if it made me think maybe I'm not a responsible parent because I I am mostly an obedient daughter. I have a good relationship with my mom. um, And um, 
you know. <laughs> I, I actually really like that quote. Yeah. Because uh, it powerful. really resonated with me because I thought I've been an adult for a long time because I'm a very disobedient daughter uh, with my mom. Um, with my dad, that's been a slower burn, right? I, that quote really struck me also because I thought it took me a long time to be adult where my dad was concerned. To make the phone call I made to say I need to push your trip for a week is pretty new. That's probably in the last, no joke, probably in the last two years. I've been able to say, no, 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 I actually need this boundary. You're still coming. You're just coming a week later. Um, and it's not going to be during spring break, and it's not going to be what we discussed, and I'm really sorry. Um, but I did feel, I felt very selfish doing that. I felt very, very selfish. Um, and and I felt unkind, and I felt like I, after all my dad's given me my whole life, that I couldn't figure out a way to make it work, but it, it really wouldn't have worked. You know, the, the logical part would have been like, he would have, been, I would have been like, here's the remote. I'll be back in two hours. That's what it would have been like this week. So I understand in my brain, the bigger picture of that, but um, I felt really bad about saying, this is what I need. Very selfish. Um, so maybe that's what was resonating with me when she said that about her mom was because I was dealing with not the same issue, but basically saying no to my dad, mm -hmm. which is really hard. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Something about that piece where she was talking about you can't come on this island until you have fully accepted. Um, I don't I don't know. It, it bothered me a little bit. What bothered you, Kathy? One of the things that bothered me is very similar. Like, and it has a lot to do with the language in which she used it. You know, her whole philosophy about like, take care of yourself first and let it burn. And I really struggled with that a lot because it sounds so unbelievably selfish. And it's, I feel like it's a soundbite that taken out of context doesn't fully encompass what she really means mm -hmm. because she doesn't really mean let the world burn, but that's what she says over and over. And I just really didn't, that didn't resonate at all because there's so much more to it. Like, yes, you have to be true to yourself and whatever, but not at the expense of the rest of the world. Like I just don't buy into that. Um, I don't know. That was the piece that struck me. And she uses that analogy throughout the entire book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. She does repeatedly. But then at the same time, I totally hear you, Kathy. I can totally see why that would rub you the wrong way. Uh -huh. It didn't rub me the wrong way because I knew or there was an underlying, an underlying knowing that she's still parenting and right. paying her bills and whatever. Right. But you're right. Out of context, it's like burn it all down. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, and even you know, the relationship with her ex-husband, like she doesn't burn it to the ground. Like that's not even an accurate statement. Like right, right. the relationship changed, they got divorced, whatever, but there's clearly a very solid relationship with that dude. Right. right like right. a very, it appears to be a very healthy relationship for all of them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It just, that was one of, that was the, that actually was the main thing that bothered me in the book. Yeah. I think it's the language of how it she said it. A hundred percent. It was the language. But um, however, you know, they say that saying you take care of yourself, you automatically take care of everybody else. Well, and that was kind of her point. Actually, yeah, that's her point, but it is not literal. <laughs> you know, it's yes. not literal. If, I mean, Georgia and I both had the stomach flu at the same time. Clearly, I'm running the show. I didn't go, uh, screw you, Georgia. I'm also vomiting. You know, <laughs> I, I am taking care of her first while I also vomit. You know what I mean? And then, and I have another child in another room that I have to make sure is okay, too. So if you took that literally, you would close your bedroom door and go, eight-year-old, six-year-old, you're on your own. You know what I mean? Uh, that's not possible. So you, I think, I think you're right. It's about the wording. Uh, it's about an abstract meaning, right? The abstract meaning is make sure you're happy because if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But 
you can't be happy all day. And she says that too. I love the stuff that she said about not being happy yeah. all the time. Like there's a part that I just opened up to about when she goes to a, a 12 step program and she's like, oh, I feel terrible. I'm, you know, I'm just six days sober and I feel like shit and whatever. And the woman comes up and she's like, thank you for sharing. I relate. And she's like, I want to tell you something somebody told me in the beginning. Yeah. It's okay to feel all the stuff you're feeling. You're just becoming human again. You're not doing life wrong. You're doing it right. If there's any secret you're missing, it's that doing it right is just really hard. Feeling mm-hmm. all your feelings is hard, but that's what they're for. Feelings are for feeling, all of them. Mm-hmm. And she, re- I mean, goes on in lots of different sections talking about your birthright isn't, there's so much like focus on happiness. Mm-hmm. Like for us, but also for our kids. And mm-hmm. this resonated for me with my kids and for me as a parent that a lot of the time it's like, oh, they're unhappy. Like make it better, make it better, make it better. Mm-hmm. Instead of like allowing them to go through that and then to have the experience that she had where she says, and on the next page, the first revelation she had about is I can feel everything and survive. What I thought would kill me didn't. Every time I said to myself, I can't take this anymore, I was wrong. The truth was that I could and did take it all, and I kept surviving. Yes, yeah, called that, resilience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's called resilience. And you can't build resilience in a vacuum. You, ha- you can only build resilience by feeling all those bad feelings. I think we forget that. In my parenting life today, we are struggling with orthodontics with Isla. She's done. She's ready to get out of braces, but she's not finished. She has six months left and a nasty appliance that has to be installed in her mouth. And she's coming undone about it. And uh, my philosophy is that you parent her through the undone and get 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 it done. And her dad has been about taking care of her emotions, which is valid also. But at this point, he's putting off the inevitable so that he doesn't have to make her feel the pain. And today I said to him, I think we've been indulgent enough. We have indulged her fear, her anxiety, her worry, her anger about this. I mean, the child, the orthodontist said to her, no one should ever have to have this much orthodonture, but your skull was structurally in such bad shape that you had to, and it stinks and it's not fair. But this is where we are, and we are almost at the finish line. Let's just finish. And Bert's like, let's not tell her today that she's moving on. And I'm like, I'm so done with that. We we placated her, and we gave her what she asked for, which was more information from the orthodontist. So now we're going to move forward. And he is so afraid of her having to feel those feelings that he will he will put it off and leave me to deal with it entirely. And I keep thinking we are not doing her any favors. We're not doing her any favors by. You're also not doing Leanne any. No, well, that's par for the fucking course (laughs) with that guy. But, uh, you know, he will avoid any kind of negative emotion at all costs, which is the point. Uh, You would hope that you would want a child to look at the path ahead and say, this is going to suck and I can handle it. Because. How many, I mean, I say this to them all the time. There were Mother's Day at Lowry's, the prime rib was a joke. We had to be there for lunch, which was a dinner only restaurant. And the clientele that comes to out to eat on Mother's Day, come out to eat on Mother's Day only the whole year. And I would make 5% of my total sales that day. And I just knew That was one of those days I just got to get through the day. And you can't look at that day and come completely undone. You have to look at that day and go, this entire day from the time I wake up until I go to bed is going to suck and just get through it. And we're not teaching her to do that by saying, well, let's ask the doctor one more question. Let's have one more Zoom meeting so he can explain it again so you'll feel better about the fact that we're going to tell you you have to do it anyway. I would have... I would never have had the first meeting. I would have just said, this is the way it is. We pay this person who's an expert. Uh, That indulgence, I don't think does anybody any good in the long run. You know, at a certain point, you just got to dig your heels in and go. And then on the flip side, it's over. And you're like, look, you did it. You did it. 
Exactly. Like that's, like that's the end goal is for them to feel the resilience. Like I got through this. It fucking sucked. But I can do it. Yeah. Right? Like that's what you want them to walk away with. Totally. Totally. So if, if she were to apply, make myself happy, she would have the braces off. <laughs> she can't apply that. Put yourself first. In her opinion, putting herself first would be to take the braces off right now. So I don't I think know. That's what it is. It's just like, I don't know. She boils it down into a sound bite, but that's not really what she means. She doesn't no. mean just make yourself happy. She doesn't no. mean take the braces off now. No. Like that's not really what she's saying at all. And I don't know. I just had a hard time with that. But was that the only thing that and the only other thing that I was like, I don't really get that this is a memoir in my brain. I feel like a memoir is about your entire life. And this is such a tiny thing and it's great and whatever. Happy. But let me educate you. I have <laughs> tell me. I am studying <laughs> memoir. memoir. Um, You're only 40. Like, yes, but oh, this, this, this may actually help you understand why I'm yeah. writing a memoir because I'm sure most people who hear that I'm writing a memoir think, who the fuck is she to write a memoir? <laughs> I don't think that, by the way. But I don't either. But if you, well, honestly, if you believe that that's what a memoir is, then I don't know why you don't think who the fuck is she because <laughs> what you're thinking is biography. And a biography is something that should be Literally. written about Barack Obama and Oprah and Abraham Lincoln and like Jane Goodall and like, people who have had huge lives and are older and it's literally birth to, to death or birth to wherever they are now. And it's like, you want to find out how does somebody so great, where do they come from? Like, what did their parents do? Like, how did they, what were they like? Did they have straight A's in elementary mm -hmm. school? You want all that information. A memoir is a slice of life from somebody, from anybody, from anybody's life. And it's, it's an interesting part of their life or a, a, a part viewed um, through a certain lens. So you could write a memoir, you could write a memoir about baking, you know, just so it doesn't have to be, it's, of course, it's going to end up including your kids because you end up baking for your kids. Of course, it'll end up including your friends because Leanne has um, been hounding you about Kathy's. <laughs> forced you uh, into, forced you into. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Bullied with love. Um, yes. <laughs> but, you know, you could, you don't, it doesn't have to go into everything um, in your life. It doesn't have to go into religion. It doesn't have to go into your relationship with the, your family, whatever. It is, it is a slice of life. It is a period of time. So the memoir that I am writing, for example, is um, starts when Vivian is born. And um, it's about 10 years of our lives as parents and the, the medical journey that we were on um, and the sort of medical mysteries, because mm -hmm. we had a premature baby, uh, which was a surprise to us. We weren't expecting it. You know, some, some births, when you have triplets, you probably know that you're going to have preemies. They say they're probably going to be born early. We did not know that. So it goes from that, you know, straight out of the gate. Wow. Oh, this is a surprise. And then we find out that there's something going on with Camille. And then we find out that there's something else going on with Vivian. And then, and it's, um, so it's, it's about that. It's not about like, well, I was born in 1972 and <laughs> whatever. Um, that would be an autobiography and nobody needs to read my autobiography because I haven't accomplished anything great. <laughs> well, that's not entirely I true. Know that I would agree with that, but but well, I'm glad you explained that actually, you know, yeah, me too, actually. And maybe I just want more. Um, but yeah, I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> so she hints at early on in this, that her previous memoir yeah. was about, um, finding out that her husband, um, is cheating and, yeah. um, about that, that growth. And then she says in here, like to him, damn it, you've ruined you're ruining my memoir. Like <laughs> so, or when she found out that he was cheating, that was ruining, or maybe the first memoir was about her happy family. And then yeah. he's like, you ruined my memoir. Right. Right. <laughs> you negated it. Um, I always, my joke with Richard is whenever, <laughs> whenever we're like, if he's giving me trouble about something or if we're just, if he's teasing me, I'm like, be careful. I'm still writing that memoir. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> That's really funny. I didn't even know this was a memoir. I thought it was sort of a a a, a cool self help book. That's what I thought it was. 
I didn't even think it was a memoir. I mean, I knew it was about her personal life, but sort of a hybrid. I think it's sort of a hybrid. It's almost like a collection of like really personal essays. Yeah. Maybe that's exactly what a memoir is. (laughs) No, they're actually personal essay is a different, is different than a memoir. A personal essay is like David Sedaris, where there isn't like a through line through. If you read a book of his essays, there's not a through line where it's like, it started in one place and then it ends, you know, and there's an arc in a memoir, in a true memoir, there has to be a character arc. And it, it sort of, it has to read in some ways like a novel, like Miss Pat's was a memoir that it Mm -hmm. read like a novel with that arc. Whereas David Sedaris, you can appreciate any of those essays on their own, or you can read them out of order and it's not going to affect the the outcome. There's not like an overarching story. So (laughs) my my creative writing teacher said that was called memoir in essay form. So they were all personal stories, basically memoirs, but they were all kind of standalone little memoirs in in an essay form. That's what he recommended I do with my stories was there's no through line with all the stories I wrote in that class. He was like, you should publish these as a memoir in essay form. I was like, someday I'll get back to that. I don't know when (laughs) I'm going to be able to do that again. That's something that's been really frustrating me is I miss that very, very much. And I have absolutely no bandwidth for it now. None, none whatsoever. Not even, not even a crack of a like glimmer of light to sit down and do any of that. Not until probably the fall. If I'm lucky, (laughs) we'll see. That's a little frustrating too. Anything else we should discuss about this book? This book, I mean, we could discuss it for several. Uh, honestly, we could discuss it for a lot of different sessions. I agree. <laughs> I, feel like. uh, I think that this book would be very valuable for someone who is trying to figure out what they want and who they are. You know, I think um This book would validate a lot of people who felt a little lost in some way or another. Not, and I'm not even talking about it LGBTQ lost. I'm talking about just in general, feeling like you don't communicate with your parents, feeling like you don't communicate with your spouse or your kids. It's a really great book. Um, I enjoyed it very much, and I'm going to finish it. I mean, this is one of the only books where I was like, well, I'm just going to I'm going to finish it even after we discuss it, because I want to hear what else she has to say. And part of me, I've had to rush the last several days through the last part of this book to try and get to today. And I regret it. I want to go back and read again when I can digest it, because like I was doing in the beginning when I was going through those pieces that were very personal to me, I was sitting and digesting it. And it's hard a book like this, I think for me anyway, I mean, last night I was, I I was driving home with Bert and I said, I know I've been talking about this book a lot. Um, but she was talking about, uh, religion and what I just read today. And I feel like I finally, like I said, in the beginning of this podcast, finally found someone who, who can explain the way I feel about my relationship with God. And I don't feel like I had enough time to digest it. Like, I want to go back and read it again and really digest it. I was trying to explain that relationship to Bert, who is Catholic and who is not practicing, but he's very Catholic. I mean, he does the, this thing every day and he talks to the things on his necklace as the Saint Saint Jude on his necklace. And he says is like, what are they? Hail Marys or something? Mm-hmm. Is that what it's called? Rose, the rosary. Yeah, yeah, that stuff. Uh, he says that often. He prays a lot. And he very much kind of believes in what he was taught growing up. And, you know, we had a a tragedy in our neighborhood that you all know about um, where a young person passed away unexpectedly. And uh, it was very shocking and very um, upsetting to uh, to a lot of people in our neighborhood and to me also. And I said to Bert last night, you know. She's right. If you really believe in God, then at some point you have to say that this is, this is, this is, I mean, I don't think I could say this if this happened to me and it were my child, but for me as a member of this community, witnessing this from the outside, the way that I comfort myself is to say, for whatever reason, this is what God meant to happen. And I can't question that because I have such a deep faith in God. In God, but I don't know that I could say that if it were my own child. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I don't know how it would feel. There is a quote in this book. I don't know where it is. I don't know that I highlighted it, but I thought of that exact situation. You did. did. She said something about what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, that is really, really relevant Mm. and important. And I don't know that I could feel that way if it were me. And I don't Mm. know how they're feeling, Mm. but it made me think of that same thing. Yeah, no, I can't imagine how they're feeling. But but in this time where it's not my family, it's not my burden, what has given me comfort, because some of our friends have called me and like, I can't sleep at night thinking about this terrible thing that's happened. And I, I felt very much the same, you know, just so upset that this would happen to anybody, not just someone I know, but in general. And um The one thing that's given me comfort is to believe that there's a a being bigger than me that knows what's going on, (laughs) that I I I have no answer for why this happened. And I think we always want an answer. And I wanted an answer, but when there is no answer, that's my answer. Does that make sense? When there is no answer, I lean on this must be something that God intended to happen for whatever reason. And it gives me comfort. Um. Bert was like, that gives me no comfort at all. <laughs> and I re- I mean, I understand. Maybe that's just how I cope, you know. But what are you thinking, Kirsten? I see your little brain. I, I'm with Bert. This. That, that <laughs> with Bert. brings me zero comfort at all. Um, when, um, when Vivian was in the hospital and was her life was very tenuous, um, mm. religious people would say that to me that, you know, God's will and whatever. And I wanted to fucking punch them in the face. Right. That's I'm sure. how I felt. Um, um, well, like I said, I don't know that I could feel that way if it were my child. I don't, I can't say, I don't, I have no idea how I would feel. Luckily, I haven't had to learn that. Um, but as an outsider looking in, that gives me comfort as an outsider which may sound really selfish. And I hope anybody in the neighborhood that's listening knows that I'm, I, I, our heart just broke when we found that when we got that news. It just, uh, we were so heartbroken. Um, anyway, in religion, I think it's, or a connection to God is supposed to give you comfort when it's hard, when times are hard and there are no answers. I think that's part of the purpose of, your, of faith is faith, <laughs> you know, having faith. But anyway, ending on that low note. <laughs> what are we reading next time? I mean, you, I've been prepared the last couple of times and I've had book suggestions. This time I have no suggestions. Anybody have any suggestions? I don't know. I know you came up with this one, but last time I did show up with like five book possibilities. I don't remember your possibilities. Uh, one one was The Color Purple, which I've never read, which yeah. is a novel. One was um, a book by Brene Brown um, called um, something about being... The Gift of Imperfection? Yes. Something gift, like that? Yes, The Gift of Imperfection. Um, and one of them was, wasn't it to read Persuasion or reread like oh, Pride uh, Jane and Prejudice. Austen? Yes. Pride and Prejudice. Oh, right. It was to reread Pride and Prejudice. Um which we could still do. You know, <laughs> I love I, that idea. I think that's fun. We could do that. Um, uh, I read Jane Eyre. That's why that came up was because I recently reread Jane Eyre. And Sandy's daughter just had to read Jane Eyre in her English class. And she's been talking to me about it. And she's so into that book. And as am I. And so we've been. I've been having all these conversations that's with awesome. her about Jane Eyre <laughs> as she's reading. And she's like... I hope that I hope she ends up with Rochester. I mean, I'm really hoping, but if she doesn't, I mean, I guess this other guy's okay, but I mean, and we're having these like, it's TikTok (laughs) conversations about a book. That's how old. And then she finished the book and called me and she was like, I can't believe they ended up together. This is the best book I've ever read. And I felt so inspired by this younger generation that reads all this stuff that's like you know she's part alien part nymph and i was you know there's no like reality it's awesome i read stuff like that too with stephen king but no one reads like the classics and likes them my kids hate them so she and i have a date 
to watch the movie Jane Eyre together because she thinks she's really going to like the movie. And I love the movie. That's awesome. That's really cool. So I'd be, I would be into rereading Pride and Prejudice or any Jane Austen novel, Sense and Sensibility <laughs> or Mansfield Park or. Sure. Is that yeah. what we're doing? I think it's a great idea. So which should it be? Which one? Yeah. I've read all of them and I like all of them. Is there any one that you guys haven't read or. I don't, I don't, I don't even remember which ones I read and it it was so long ago, um, Leanne that I, uh, and then, you know, seeing movies in the interim and, and miniseries, it's like, I I don't even know what I've read. So I, (laughs) I'll be reading with new eyes. Okay. Well, should we just do Pride and Prejudice? Cause that's the one we were talking about. Okay. So there's our next book club in May, right? Since we're already in April. May, sometime in May. Does that work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies, for always reading the books. I'll send you a copy of Pride and Prejudice, too. Do you like that I do that? I love it. Oh, good, 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 good. good. But it's lovely. Of course I do. If if I'm asking you to read a book for the podcast, I should at least buy you the book. The last time um, we weren't (laughs) expecting a delivery, like it was just one of these rare (laughs) moments in time that nothing was expected at all. And Amazon arrived and we were all like, oh, what could it be? Like, <laughs> so excited. And I was like, it's for me. It's for me. My book. That's so cute. That's yeah, so I cute. I love getting a book. There's nothing better than getting a book in the mail. My goodness. I'm the same way. <laughs> we may be dorks, ladies. We may all, we are Girl Scout leaders <laughs> and we are readers. We are total dorks. Oh, my God. Dorks for good. Dorks for good. <laughs> bully for good. That was my saying. I'm a bully for that good. Bully for yes. We should BFG, make yeah right? a BFG. <laughs> and now we're also DFGs. And now we're definitively dorks. <laughs> yes, we are dorks for good. DFG, BFG. What else for good can we be? Oh, Kathy BFG. Bakes for good. <laughs> Kirsten WFG. Writes for good. <laughs> and we're all pfgs parenting for good yes hopefully let's hope mostly depends on the day <laughs> how about a pfg <laughs> parenting for good <laughs> right attempting that's right it's I all attempted that. yeah, yeah it's <laughs> well thanks for always best reading intentions. go ahead say it again best intentions best intentions that's the truth well, thanks for reading. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate Thank it. You. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>